In the last video in this series, we got the ringing machine moved into the museum and wired up just enough to get it spinning. Now that the hard part is done, we just have the other 90% of the work to do, getting the machine on its table and wiring it to the board behind it. If you missed the last video, go and check it out because this one's gonna pick up right where we left off. Eric actually got the table fabricated quickly. And after he bought it to the museum, we mounted the slates to the table temporarily so we could drill the holes for the bolts that would eventually fasten them to the table. And after that, Eric, Peter, and Aiden painted it black. While they were doing that, I washed the slates. They'd been sitting in the basement for literally 100 years, and they really needed a cleanup. As an aside, these are actually real slate. Back at this point, the material was still commonly used for power equipment. Later on, they replaced this with the steel table, but I think the slate just looks much nicer. Before we did any more work, we had to start getting the wiring figured out. Up until this point, we had just been using alligator clips to connect to the existing wiring, but now that we we're going to mount it to the table, it was time to put some more permanent wiring in place. On the table, there are several really nice porcelain topped conduits that the wires pass through so they can neatly be routed underneath. While the machine was still on the floor, I found some appropriate gauge wire and began splicing onto the cut leads from the tone alternator. I left each wire long enough to reach its termination point at the top of the 803 C board so that once everything was in place, it should be pretty straightforward to lay them down where they need to be. Then, Jay and I worked on the table wiring. Jay used some original 1923 wire for the ringing generator output, and I'm glad to report that we're using the original terminals too. Since they were just cast lugs, we heated them up with a soldering iron, melted new solder into them, and then jammed the stripped wire ends in there. It's actually quite satisfying, and I think I wanna do all my big terminals like this from now on. So at this point, the table and the wiring was as done as it was gonna be, so it was time to lift the machine onto the table. Peter volunteered to come in early on a Sunday morning before we opened to help with the lift. I'm pleased to report that it went pretty smoothly. The hardest part was routing the wires through the conduits while the machine was floating in midair. Once the machine was down on its table, some of the wires would have been nearly impossible to run so we had no choice but to do it that way. Okay, so we've got most of the mechanical bits figured out, ringing machine on table, table moved into its final location. Now it's time to make all that wiring look pretty and get the 803 C frames hooked up for real. I'm hooking up more of the terminal strips in the back of the 803 C power board, and we're starting to show some signs of life from the control relay circuits, which is very cool. Nothing is doing what it's supposed to yet because the control loops are all basically open. I don't have the machine totally wired to the board yet. So the machine's running independently under its own control loop, but the board has no idea what the machine's doing. So what we're seeing is lots of alarms, which is, I guess, to be expected. Check this out. So we've got a ring fuse alarm there because all of the fuses are either pulled or completely blown. I have not replaced any of the distributing fuses. We've got a ring transfer alarm. In fact, in this museum, that alarm will always be going on because we only have a DC machine here. And then we have an RAS alarm. I'm totally not sure what that is, but there it is, it's happening. And we've got an LT2 fail over here. That means that this circuit is not detecting dial tone coming from the machine. And again, the reason we were getting an LT2 and all these other alarms is because there's the output from the machine right there. And it's, as you can see, it's not going anywhere. So the board is unhappy, but I'm very happy because that shows that it's working, which is exciting. It wasn't worth it to try to do everything all at once. So instead I did the most basic thing possible and started at one end and worked my way to the other. 
This process actually took a couple of weeks, and that might seem like a long time, but I really wanted to be sure that everything was done as neatly and correctly as possible. Also, since this was my first time ever working on this equipment, I had to learn how it was supposed to work as I went along and solve problems as they came up. As an aside, a lot of this task was really frustrating because we don't have the exact drawings for this equipment. There are hundreds of pages of schematics and they all differ in tiny ways from one another. And there's really no way to determine which is the specific one that we need. The many minor differences between them make it really annoying to find the schematic that works for one part of the circuit while still being correct for another part. Of course, somewhere in a landfill in Connecticut are the original records for the Pearl Street office, but without those, all I know for sure is that one of these schematics might be close. Close enough to what we have to be helpful. Most of the time, it's just easier to buzz out each wire and see for myself where it goes. In the end, I've just resigned myself to using a bunch of different schematics for the project. Ones that don't necessarily belong together, but they fit well enough and everything works like it's supposed to. This might be a good time to talk about some of the most important functions of the 803C power board behind me. Overall, this board takes care of three main things. It monitors the output from the machines and starts or stops them as necessary. It distributes the output to the switches and it regulates the speed and voltage of the machines so that the output is consistent. As an aside, the AC machine doesn't need speed regulation since it's got a synchronous motor. But since we're running the DC machine, we definitely care about this. Let's start by talking about the voltage regulation system. The regulator looks like this. We've got a solenoid here with its coil of wire and a plunger that moves up and down. As we put more current into this coil, the plunger moves upward and with less current, the plunger moves down. This is important because attached to this plunger is a hinged arm with contacts at the end. When the plunger moves up, the contacts open down and the contacts close. We feed this solenoid with the 20 Hertz AC output of the ringing generator. Looking at the generator itself, we see a big coil of fairly thick wire here, and there's another one just like it on the other side. This is called a field coil, and its job is to produce a more or less constant magnetic field in the spinny part, which is called the armature. You can also see these big chunks of steel, which carry the magnetic field from the coils right up next to the armature windings. Over here at this end are slip rings that pull the generated 20 Hertz AC out of the armature windings. And down on this end is a commutator and brushes that pull DC out of the armature. That DC is fed right back into the field coils, and that's why they say this generator is self-excited. The more current there is in the field coils, the stronger the field, and the higher the AC and DC output voltage of the machine. So, how do we vary the amount of current in these field coils? Well, by sending the machine's output to that voltage controller up there. During periods of heavy load, the machine's output will sag a little bit, which decreases the amount of electrical sauce moving through this coil. That in turn causes the plunger in the middle to move downward, thanks to gravity. When the plunger is in its down position, its contacts are closed. The closed contacts shunt out the resistor in series with the generator field, causing more current to flow, causing more power to be generated, increasing the output. As the output power goes up, the energy in the voltage regulator coil goes up, which drives the plunger up, causing the contacts at the regulator to open. As the contacts open, that path through the resistor is now the only path that electricity can take to get to and from the field coils. The resistor limits the amount of current flow in the field coil, which reduces the generator's overall power. So it's a closed loop control system. 
in reality, this makes and breaks so quickly, it almost looks like PWM, or pulse width modulation. The contacts actually make and break tens of times per second, but the overall voltage of the system ends up just being an average of what the contacts are doing because of a thing called back EMF, which is pushing back against the changes that these contacts are making. If it's a little more intuitive, you can think about this as the inertia of the field is resisting those fast changes, producing kind of an average. So the other cool thing about this frame, the other thing it does for us in the DC motor is speed regulation. And Peter actually did a lot of, a lot of math on this, and I figured that he should be the one to talk about it because this is actually really interesting uh, what he and some other volunteers were able to figure out. So, right, so. right. So this thing has a DC motor. It's a shunt wound type of DC motor. So it has a pretty flat torque speed curve, which means that it doesn't slow down all that much when you're add load or when the voltage goes down, but it still slows down. And it was more than they wanted. They wanted to try to get this curve to be as flat as they possibly could so that the output frequency stayed as close to 20 hertz as they could get it to stay using the technology that they had in the early 1900s. Uh, so no transistors, not even any vacuum tubes, you know, certainly no MOSFETs or SCRs or any of the stuff that you would use if you were building a modern motor speed controller today. So how did they do that? And we were kind of mystified by it because when you first look at the thing, it looks like, wow, this is way too simple. I don't see how that could even work. Um, and we started with a schematic and these schematics from 1923, they did get a lot better at this later, but the 1923 ones are this complete Where's Waldo experience. Uh, but we found Waldo, he's there and there. And so if I just show you what the motor looks like and add one component here, which is a variable resistor in series with the field winding. Now notice that the what's called the rotor winding is connected directly to the battery and the field winding has that variable resistor and there's a switch across that variable resistor and when the switch is open, the motor turns at a certain speed. When the switch is closed, the motor slows down. Now this is completely counterintuitive, but that is how shunt wound motors work. When you increase the current in the field winding, they slow down, you decrease the current, it's called field weakening, and the motor speeds up. So. That switch then, that is the whole secret to motor speed regulation on this kind of device. And you can see there's a patent date on the regulator and we dug up that patent, here it is. And here's a comparison of the modern schematic that I just showed you with the patent and you can see that uh, back in 1913, you drew resistors as a little square wave thingy and you drew coils as what we now use for a resistor. So you just have to like learn how to read old schematics when you're trying to understand these things. The idea here is that when the switch closes, power can go through the slip ring into the little speed controller out the other slip ring and back out again, thereby bypassing the resistor, causing the motor to slow down. Now, we discovered, oh, but that's not even the patent that we care about because this patent is for that thing down at the bottom there, which has to do with getting the motor to start in the first place, and that's not the thing that we're interested in. So had to do some more digging and finally found this. Uh, patented by Kellogg, interestingly enough. Kellogg, for those who don't know, was one of the competing makers. Uh, they produced equipment in competition with Western Electric, who made the rest of this machine. But they have the 1903 patent on this device. And this is a side view of it. So here's the motor shaft coming in from the side. And now it's pretty easy to see that as this thing is spinning around, this weight that's on the end of a metal spring here 
gets pushed out to the outside by the centripetal force until this contact closes here. And then the motor slows down and then the contact opens again and the motor speeds up. So that's how that works. But my next question was, well, why the heck doesn't this thing just hunt like crazy? It seems like the motor would speed up and then slow down and speed up and then slow down. Turns out that the words in the patent are the clue here. It's set up so that the contacts vibrate continuously as the motor is spinning. So here's an end-on picture of the actual regulator we have, which is the 1914 version of it. Um, slightly different arrangement, but the exact same idea. So you can see there's this weight here that's gonna go up and down. Um, held towards the center by a spring and some moving contacts. We had a robust debate about what speed this thing was going to oscillate at. And to answer that question, we got out Matt's oscilloscope, stuck it on the output. The blue line, the blue trace here, is the contacts opening and closing. And the yellow trace below that is just the 20 hertz AC output from the generator which you can think of as the shaft angle because the way this generator works, it's one full sine wave per rotation of the shaft. So it oscillates at 20 hertz at exactly once per shaft resolution, revolution. It's easy to see why it does that because when this thing is perfectly in balance so that the spring is trying to pull the weight towards the center with exactly the same force as the centripetal force is trying to pull it outward, then gravity gets to be the decider. And when it's in this position here, the contacts will open. And then as it spins around, so the weight is at the lower end, gravity pulls it down and the contacts close. Now, here's the really clever bit that took us a while to figure out. The center point of that oscillation between the open and closed position is very sensitively dependent on the speed of the rotation. So if the motor speeds up just a little bit, the center point moves slightly closer to the contacts, and so the contacts will stay closed a little bit longer. And if the motor slows down, the contacts will stay open a little bit longer. So here we are running the machine again with the oscilloscope hooked up to it, no load, and the duty cycle on those contacts is 77%. And I calculated that just by counting all of the blue pixels down at the bottom there and dividing into the total number of pixels of one uh, screen of this oscilloscope. When we add a load, the duty cycle changes to 87%. Now the speed you'll see goes from 19.95 to 19.85. So the shaft does slow down a little bit, but it is actually regulating the speed within one half of 1% of the optimal rate by changing the duty cycle on the contacts by about 10%. That way more clever than I had thought it was gonna be when I first looked at this device. Pulse width modulation at a base frequency of 20 hertz, that's not how you would do it today. Today you'd use at least 20 kilohertz and probably higher because you want to be above the audio spectrum so that your motor speed controller doesn't make annoying whining noises. But they didn't have that. So there is some consequence to this that you can see pretty clearly on the oscilloscope plot where the lower half of each sine wave is slightly elongated relative to the upper half because this thing is still speeding up and slowing down the motor at 20 cycles per second. But that little difference, that little warping of the sine wave doesn't seem to matter. The phones ring just fine on this output. So that's it. That was how motor speed control was done in 1903. It's still going to be another month or two before the switches get their proper tones from this equipment. I have to do some modifications to the number one crossbar and the panel to reverse changes that the phone company made in the 60s before the switches can actually work with this old machine. But I won't make you wait for that. We have plenty of other projects going on right now. So the next videos will focus on some of the other cool things that we've been doing. And when Colin gets back from holiday break, we'll probably be pretty close to firing up the DMS-10 for the first time.
Until next time, bye.